Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another week here at the RGM HQ. Um, it's podcast time, and we're here for another week of music, delving into the grassroots music industry, um, finding people to tell us their story, because everybody's unique. And today, ladies and gentlemen, we've got an amazing guest for you today, Lucy May Walker. Hi, mate. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, I, I've, I've seen you on telly and that, so I thought, oh, I must have a must have a chat with Lucy. You know, a lot of things to talk about, I suppose. Yeah, well done for getting in there quickly. It was like, <laughs> right, come on. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Well, yeah, thanks for joining us today. You know, people will might have seen a bit of a hullabaloo on the internet about gig etiquette and that kind of stuff, and and I completely get it. You know, I, I put gigs on, and I've seen particularly acoustic acts really struggle sometimes with certain audiences when they're at gigs and that kind of stuff. But we're going to come to all of that in a bit. I want to get to know you a bit more, Lucy. If that's okay. Right. Yeah. Brilliant. So, uh, yeah. So, so where where, where if, if anybody I can't speak, if anybody doesn't know who you are, Lucy. Introduce yourself for us for the RGM people. So I am called Lucy May Walker. Um, I am a singer songwriter. I would say folky pop. I think it's just pop, yeah. but the world of pop is so big that I just stick folk in it. So you know, I play guitar. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, singer songwriter based in London, um, and I've been doing music for about eight nine years now. Yeah, um, and are you from are you from London originally? No, I'm from Worcestershire. Uh, near Birmingham yeah ah okay I always get I always struggle with the shires <laughs> if it's not Yorkshire then I, I kind of think where are all these shires down south there's loads of them in there I get, I'm not very good with my shires geography so from that's the, the I'm from the Midlands there from you the go. Midlands right here right here brilliant okay um so how what was Lucy like as a young little kid before <laughs> before music uh, you know took you in a certain path in life talk us through you as a young lass um people don't believe this but I was really shy um like like painfully shy when you look back I just I hate shyness I think it's so it it kind of stops you from doing things um just so you and you're just like what well, I didn't do loads of things just in case I got a bit embarrassed it's just crazy to me now because I've I'm not really shy at all but um I was very shy um until and I did music and everything I did um I did ballet and tap and all of that um, growing up as, the, as a kid. So I guess that was, it was more dancing as a child. And then um, I went to college. Uh, I think this is where I kind of lost my shyness because all of uh, my friends at school were staying on to sixth form. Hmm. And uh, I wanted to do performing arts and my school stopped doing the course. So I knew I had to go to college, um, which was terrifying for me. Um, as someone who was so shy and you know didn't really put them put themselves out there but um, I think that was a real turning point for me to kind of I knew I had to go out of my comfort zone to do what I love um, so yeah I did performing arts at college then I went on to do performing arts at um, university in Cumbria in Carlisle lovely place in the world um, and then after uni I moved to London um, to do music so I didn't really kind of, I wish, well, I don't know, no regrets and all of that. But like, I do feel like if I went back, I should have probably started music in my hometown and build a career there and then moved okay. rather than moving to London and starting music as, you know, you, you're you one of many doing that. So it's hard. Yeah, it definitely is. It's a very saturated industry and people find their own way through this bloody music industry don't they and in, in in many different ways and people do tend to start from in the uh, in the home city maybe stay in the home city too long as well sometimes i think some artists True. and don't try and venture out and get out of the comfort zone there's a lot of t there's a lot to be said to get out of your comfort zone isn't there mm, i think everything like the best things in life are, happen when you put yourself out there and it might be uncomfortable for a little bit but you know all of my any opportunity I've ever had in music is from me um, hustling and it's not something that comes naturally to me or it didn't. Now it is. Um, but yeah. No, I, 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 I'll, I'll talk to you about the hustle and bustle of it all shortly, but uh, just, you know, before you got into music and stuff, like what, what were you like as a kid at school? I, I know you were shy and that kind of stuff, but getting yourself out of comfort zone so young, that's a massive step. Like mechanically, how did it feel when you, like your first few days of being out there in the big old world of co college, how did you physically, mechanically, you know, just break that bubble a little bit? 
Um, oh God, it was a long time ago now. I don't know. Uh, I think I was excited. I think I was more excited about the course and everything. Um, and actually it was, it was, um, I had some co comfort zones in there because um, turns out my old dance teacher from uh, school ended up being my dance teacher at, at college. So I still had a few people um, that I kind of knew, but I think just being around other people that have the same kind of dreams and aspirations as you, it's really inspiring. So um, you're not the only person wanting to be a superstar there's lots of uh, other people uh, with the same dream i guess that that helps that's good it's just putting yourself in a different surroundings isn't it so but so at school before that stage then was it, was it just people that were like i don't know destined to be to do other non-creative things <laughs> and you were creative in the middle of that kind of stuff no there were a few and, and i started yeah. I, I did like some singing lessons and stuff at, at school, but with the shy thing, you know, that they, they started doing like pantomimes at school, but I was just so shy that I would, wouldn't even audition. So no one really knew that I sang until, oh yeah, I did a school assembly um, when we were leaving. Yeah. Um, my singing teacher was like, you, you should sing a song. So I sang um, Goodbye My Lover by James Blunt. There we you. go. Um, and I remember singing that and I was terrified because no one had heard me sing before. And then I was really sad because I was moving to college. So that was an interesting experience, singing that song and then crying. <laughs> and then all of my, you know, when like the X factor, yeah. when it, the person's leaving and they're doing their goodbye song and then all the contestants come and join them and hug oh, okay. them. Yeah. Well, it was like that, but they didn't hug me. They just all hugged each other. So I was still left like crying on my own, not singing. <laughs> <laughs> when, when did you first realise you've got a voice in you then? Like even before that, before you like, you know, um, put out there a bit? Yeah, I, I, because I, I literally started ballet from two years old, which is ridiculous. Um, and I did ballet. Do you have the little shoes and stuff at two? Not the point shoes. That comes know, later. Yeah. But um, yeah, some. Those. <laughs> that's a reflection on me that <laughs> the answer, you're being stupid yeah go on <laughs> yeah your feet have to be like fully formed right, before right, you can right, go yeah. on point shoes um so with ballet I did um competitions and I also did disco as well like freestyle dancing nice. it's hilarious yeah. now because I cannot dance <laughs> um and in in ballet competitions there were different um categories and there was a song and dance category um, so I would always um, take part in this song and dance. So basically, it's kind of what, what it says on the tin. You do a bit of singing and a bit of dancing. Um, and I would nine times out of ten win that category. So I, I knew there was something there. Um, and then I grew up listening to BBC Live Lounge, mm -hmm. you know, when they would take a cover of a song and make it their own. Um, before I write, uh, wrote my own songs, that's how I kind of found my voice um, by covering other people's songs. And yeah, I just kind of, even when I went to uni to do performing arts, even though that was acting, dancing and all everything, I always knew that I wanted to be a musician from, I don't know, probably the age of about 16. Yeah. So started, did you, when did you start thinking about doing it like publicly and, you know, finding that? how did you do it in fact forget that question how did you develop okay. you know, writing your own stuff you know because that's that's a different thing in it you know you mentioned there that you're doing the live, live lounge stuff covering a few other you know your favorite people and trying to make a song your own did that develop quite quickly into writing your own stuff so when I was at uni um it was like my last year at uni when I started thinking right you need to start doing music and I would call myself a singer-songwriter and my friends would laugh at me because mm. I had never written a song so I really wasn't a singer-songwriter <laughs> but in my heart I was um and yeah I did lots of covers and I took part in a competition um called Open Mic UK um and that's when I was like right okay this is what I want to do and it wasn't till I had my first heartbreak classic that I wrote my first song um and then I think you have to have a certain amount of life experience to be able to write mm. um so I started quite late to the game but um as soon as I wrote that first song and started performing it like open mics and stuff I was like oh okay this is it's one thing to I love singing and I love performing but it's one thing doing covers and to be able to do your own songs live is just unimaginable. It's it's yeah. amazing feeling. 
And it, was that in London when you started to do open mics? And was that a bit before that? Yeah, so I moved to London and uh, I just got a job in a coffee shop. Um, and then about six months, I, I moved to London to do music. Mm. And then obviously life happens and I was like, okay, how do I actually do this? And was that I, was that to study music or just to be a musician? To be a musician. In my head, I thought you had to be in London to do that. And yeah. it turns out you don't. And I could have saved a lot of money. <laughs> but uh, it worked for me. And I started doing some open mics um, uh, when I first moved here. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of how I, I started. And then I started busking. And so busking was a massive, it still is a massive part of um, my career, I guess. Yeah. Oh, I, I love that. Yeah, it's just a... I'm stuttering today. I don't know what's up with me. It's in, early. It is quite early, isn't it's it? It's really me? early. Uh, so, yeah, d- d- you know, moving into London, that must be, for me, just even moving to London now would feel quite intimidating. Like, so as a as a young Lucy, did you move down on your own? I did, yeah. Um, how, was... do you, how do you acclimatise to that or even know where to, to you know, it, everything's just so expensive down there. How, do, how did you find somewhere to live and be able to afford and to eat and stuff? How, how did that all happen? Yeah, it was, well, to basically to live in London, you have to flat share. So I, I found a flat um, and I was, you know, it was, it was a pretty good deal at the time. This probably isn't to anyone listening who's yeah. not from London, but it was like 500 quid a month. Right. Um, so I was, yeah, I moved on my own. I got the job first at the coffee shop yeah. and then quickly found somewhere to live and was very lucky that the people that I lived with were really lovely. Um, I had a couple of friends in London, but um, I actually have a song called you're not alone which is literally about how lonely london can be yeah. um because I, I remember the first morning i got there i was so excited and i, I walked down the street and i said oh good morning <laughs> to someone <laughs> yeah okay oh my god if you've ever said good morning to a stranger in london they literally look at you like i will punch you in the face <laughs> um so you kind of yeah you climatize quite <laughs> quite quickly to putting your head down and not speaking to people but um yeah I I don't know it was it wasn't easy actually moving um to London it took me a, a while to kind of find my feet and and start actually doing music and meeting like-minded people um but I really love I've lived, lived here now for eight years so I really love living here I don't think it's going to be forever but I think um yeah, if I if I could do it again, I'd probably do exactly the same thing. So, as a brand new artist, how do you how do you start to make waves in London in this big, oversaturated hub of creative people all looking to fulfill dreams of being in the music industry and that kind of stuff? How do you like? How where do you start? Um, so I started busking. Um, hmm. I had a couple of friends um, who took part in this um, busking competition called the mayor of london's busking competition or something like that gigs the Mm. big big busk i don't know it was back when um when boris johnson actually was the mayor um and yeah so i took part in this competition where you basically busked for like votes and um rather than money which looking back I wish I had got money, but you know, um, it was a nice <laughs> way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pay to play. Yeah. Um, it was a nice kind of introduction into busking, where there was like these people around you, kind of looking out for you. Um, so there was like a like staff um, kind of supervising you whilst you did like a short set on on the underground things like that. And I got nowhere in the competition, but I just that's actually where I started meeting people and they were like oh are you a busker like full time I was like is that a thing you can do Mm. um and the more I spoke to people they kind of said I think you'd be pretty good at this um so once the competition had ended I just bought all the gear um and then I started busking at Borough Market um there was like a a a pitch there and I went I just happened to be at the right place at the right time I said can I busk here and they said actually that we have we have like three resident buskers and one of them's just left so i managed to go. get that slot um every week and um busking is that, is that like a, a a daily thing so can you do yeah, that I did it. Like once you've claimed your space can you do is that your space do you yes. have times i don't know how that works the busking uh, well that's a, yeah um i did tuesdays 12 till 2 um yeah. at the time uh, every tuesday 
um busking is a whole thing so now I have lots of different licenses um to busk in London so I have an underground license and you book your slots two weeks in advance on an online booking system oh. I have a um, you have to pay for that no but you have to audition um so they don't accept everyone oh okay and, and then South Bank Centre so by the London Eye same thing you have a license and you that's a queuing system it's a whole thing yeah um, but busking it was amazing for me um I never dreamed of being a busker um but it allowed me to kind of te well get better because I was new to new to guitar as well I only started um playing guitar the last year of uni um so that's quite late in the game again like I must have been 21 at the time um and uh yeah so it allowed me to kind of get better uh hone my craft mm. uh, get better at guitar I would do all covers and then I'd maybe do like one original because at the time I only had probably one original yeah. and um, just built my confidence and uh yeah busking was was an amazing for me and you are promoting yourself every single day um so I just that's how I, I built my fan base probably for the first four years or something was just um my whole fan base were people who saw me busking um it's changed a bit now but but yeah. still those those core fans are still there i suppose you still get like instant feedback as well don't you from it yeah and 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 busking is an art form um so you might do something busking that really works and then you try and do that in a live setting in a gig like venue and it and it won't it's i see them as two really separate things like what? um what what could you do busking that you couldn't do at a gig um i think the chat it will also right. every busking pitch is different so yeah. i busk also at edinburgh fringe festival and that's the whole thing on its own um just the chat with the audience trying to get them to come come mm. to you so like if you have an audience at a gig, it's really easy to get them to sing. But if you ask strangers on a street to sing with you, um, <laughs> okay, it's, it's a little bit harder. But um, I mean, I, it has been done. Um, but yeah, it's it's two very different things. And um, it is an art form for sure. Yeah, I can imagine because yeah, when like when we put gigs on and there's, it, you tend to get people like stood towards the back, don't you? while it's filling, filling up that kind of stuff and you have to you have to guide people to come on come a bit closer so i, can't, I don't see this gap and it it'll just be a nicer nicer space for everybody won't it when there's not that physical gap between you and the audience yes <laughs> yeah i hate and i hate that because i do the same thing if i walk into a gig I'm, i don't want to stand at the front yeah um but it makes such a difference from the artist like Oh, oh, it's it's easy to get in your head, but if you're looking out and all you can see is yes, there might be loads of people around the end, but you're just like I'm performing to a blank bit of yes. uh, floor. <laughs> <laughs> so where would you where where would you um where do you think you are within the music industry at the minute? Then where where is where are you and where what's the next stage for you? Do you think? So um, my career has gone on such a journey. Um, mm -hmm. So I started busking and then um, I was actually discovered. I don't know if you if you know this, but I talk about it all the time. Um, I was actually discovered busking um, by Jeremy Vine. Oh, wow. Um, five, four years ago, five years ago, I think, actually. Um, and that really kickstarted my career because I ended up performing on BBC Radio 2. Mm. Um, did a live session with him. And then off the back of that, I uh, I went on tour with Wet Wet Wet. Um, so if I'm really... favorite band. I know every song. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're great. Um, people always always ask me what Marty Pello's like, but he's not in the band anymore. Did you know that? Yeah, I know. Uh, my mum goes to see him. It literally does everything Marty Pello. Whatever. I'm I'm taking her next year. He's doing an arena thing. Oh so okay. Next year for Manchester to see him, but wish him well. What a song it is great song and I knew all of them at the end I did I only knew a few when I started that tour <laughs> um but yeah so that kind of really kick-started my career but that was just uh, it was 2019 so just pre-covid and it felt like I was on this like you know I was things were happening it was exciting and then covid hit and it felt like 
everything just had to start again after that. Yeah. Um, so it's really, I mean, you know what the music industry is like. It's very fickle. And I think back in the day, you would have had these make it moments um, and that would be it. Like you can have, you know, something like that could just be like, right, she's off. Yeah. But you just got to keep going and keep going because people will forget about you the next week. Um, so, yeah, I started again. I released uh, an EP after COVID um, and I went on tour with Texas um, last year. Last year? Yeah, um, which was amazing. Um, Can I just rewind a little bit? Just just to the Jeremy Vine thing a little bit. So yeah. how did that physically... So, so, so did you just walk past and enjoyed your, your performing and say, come on, Radio 2? <laughs> um, not quite. So <laughs> okay, fair enough. I mentioned the hustle earlier, right? Yeah, okay. So he, I actually didn't see him. So he tweeted oh. um, saying, I've just seen this amazing busker at Charing Cross Station. Oh. Um, can't remember her name, but it had Walker in it. Okay. Um, so then lots of people then tweeted him saying, I think that must be Lucy May Walker, mm. which thankfully it was. <laughs> and then that was it. And then I messaged him, slid into the DMs. I was like, Jeremy, hi. Yeah. Um, I know you've got a BBC Radio 2 care. show. <laughs> um, I, please, can I send you my music? Thinking, that, you know, that's not really how it works, is it? But um, yeah, he was like, yeah, yeah, send it along. I thought nothing of it. And then he played um, one of my songs the next week on, um, was it Heartbreak Song? I think it's Heartbreak Song. Um, the next week on the radio and told this story of how he'd seen me busking and um the listeners were like loving the fact that he'd like discovered me so then I messaged him again and I was like hi Jeremy me again uh, hello um I was just thinking um <laughs> if you wanted me to come and do a live session or an interview then like I'd be totally up for it and um, he messaged back and he's like, yeah, okay, yeah, I was thinking the same thing. I'm sure he was not thinking <laughs> the same thing. But yeah, so um, I basically made that happen. Just, you've oh. got it. These things are very rare. I'd been yeah. busking for four or five years before this happened. So when they happen, you've got to milk it for all you've got. And I am still milking it. <laughs> oh, I love that. Because I do speak to a lot of artists that are sometimes cheeky with, um, you know, established you know, big people in the industry and it can work. I've seen, I've seen it happen a few times. You, you've you just got to go about it the right way, haven't you? I suppose there's a right way and a wrong way of doing it. I suppose, you know, just, just sending loads of the same message out to loads of people. That's not really going to work. There needs to be a, there needs to be an angle. There needs to be a reason for them to reply to you, don't they? I suppose. Yeah. And the worst thing, I think people are terrified and they're like, Oh no, I can't do that. And I'm like, well, what's literally the worst thing that can happen to you is they say no. And most of the time yeah. they won't say no, they'll just ignore you. Yeah. Um, and that's something I've, I've really learned when, if I look back to how shy I was, you know, God, I would never do that 10 years ago, but um, you just, if you want it, like you have to make it happen for yourself. People think these opportunities come to you. They don't. Um, you have to ask for them um, politely. Yeah. Politely. Um, there's a way of doing it. Like so many people have asked me to like support them. Have asked me to support them. Asked me if they can support me. Let me yeah. say that again. So many people have <laughs> asked me if they can support me on a tour. Yeah. And. Um, I just I just sometimes think god read your message back like yeah. you don't even follow me yeah, yeah you you know you don't say, like I think compliments go a long way if you're going to ask something maybe just like compliment the person first like oh my god I love this I love your music yeah. I saw you live on this day um I would love to support you blah 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 like but I just get like these cold messages going, hey, can I support you? I'm like, yeah, that's not really going to happen, is it? <laughs> we get those kind of submissions on the magazine. Loads of them. Just an email, yeah. random email saying, uh, just a link to Spotify. Would love it if you could cover it. And that's it. I'm just like, no, it's not. It don't you've you've got to tell that person what they're going to like. It's yeah. a two way thing. Yes. you. Uh, what are they going to get out of, of you? You're yeah. not just going to do them a favor for no reason, right? Mm -hmm. Just a random person, you know, I, I, I ain't got time to listen to every email that you get as well. It's a time thing, isn't it? You know, it's a 24 hour business, the music industry sometimes, isn't it? And you've got to keep yourself sane by not 
You've got to, you've got to have some personal time yourself as well, aren't you? Whenever. Yes, <laughs> relatable. <laughs> so did wet wet so wet wet wet? Then how did they contact you then? Was that straight after the Radio Two thing? Um, so I did a charity gig with Graham Clark, who is the bassist, um, and I did I supported him. He has uh, his own solo career, um, and it was always in. I think they were had just announced their tour or something, and he always said like, "I'll put your name into the hat." they have a, a hat <laughs> I don't think it's an actual hat um and you know basically they'll suggest people um to support and he'd said it the tour before like oh I'll put your name in and um he actually told me um I was already going to be considered but I think it was him that told me it was um their kind of booking agent or whoever it was when I got that recognition of radio two they went right okay cool yeah. Um, and I'm pretty sure that wouldn't have happened if I didn't have have that success. So um, again, hustle. It was me. It was all me. Yeah. <laughs> <I'm> just... <laughs> what what size theatres and gigs were were those shows? Um, a couple of thousand, I think. Oh. Um, yeah, real big uh, change from busking. Yeah, I can um, imagine. So, how how did you react to that type of crowd being further away from you and? um being brand new to you I suppose busking you get a lot of people that are brand new to you so you'll be used to that side of it but you know having thousands of people in front of you that, that are there to see a, a gig how did you how did you manage that situation um I know a lot of people don't like doing support gigs but I actually love it I love the challenge of <laughs> going out on stage to you know a couple of thousand people who have no idea who you are and they are there to see the headliner yeah um so I think also the audience kind of the age of the, their audience um was really respectful um so yes they were there to see wet 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 but it was in theaters where they're seated and they were um I don't know I guess more uh, susceptible to hear it is that right is that the right words I think so I can imagine I can imagine them now sat down with a little snacks and a pint before they came out just all, res- all respectful red wine it was red, one red of those. Wine, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um and I just love the challenge and I think you know I was so excited to be there so um so grateful for the opportunity um and I just think right you've got half an hour mm. to absolutely try and get every single person um walking out as a Lucy May Walker fan and um they went really really well um I absolutely loved it um so yeah massive thank you to wet 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 for that that opportunity and and Texas also did I mention yeah Texas tell us about that that was last year um that weirdly came I think from my from my old manager Hmm. who was a booking agent and I think (laughs) because it was like two weeks um before the gig I got this message hey can you support Texas in Inverness in two weeks time and maybe they couldn't find anyone who was crazy enough to travel (laughs) I was was like yep here I go so 12 hours it took to go up to Inverness um to support them and um wow that was 5,000 people um I don't know if 5,000 were there for me but you know as in they didn't obviously didn't come for me but they weren't all there for my set because obviously I'm, I'm there like doors but um god that was that was amazing um I think a really good match as well um kind of music wise and having two um you know frontliners women Mm. um yeah those gigs are amazing so I did Inverness and then I did Sterling um but did they get you on one and then think this is working we'll get you on a few more type things I think that's what happened yeah Yeah. um yeah it was that was amazing and I, I wish I really would like a booking agent um, because I I actually don't have one, which people are like, how did you get all these gigs? I'm like, it's (laughs) just the hustle, baby. Um, Because of that, I just, that is, oh, I love supporting other artists and stealing their fan base. (laughs) Did you chat much to Charlene? I actually didn't. Um, I had a picture with her and she was very nice. um, But yeah, I didn't actually get to to chat to her. Um, One person I did support... (laughs) Sorry, I'm just bragging now. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's okay. Um, Tony Hadley. Oh, nice one. And he was really, he chatted to me so much that his manager was telling him off because um, 
his meet and greet people who paid to meet oh they were waiting oh, okay yeah and he just kept talking to me um so yeah did, that was a did great he give, experience. did he give you any words of gold that's a rubbish joke as well very good Sorry, i do apologize <laughs> um yeah we were talking about um what were we talking about um uh, uh we're talking about he has a vocal coach or something um yeah. and he was kind of i can't i think i was complaining about something um and then and then he was like oh you should speak to this person um yeah. which makes it sound like he was like oh you're awful here's some singing <laughs> it wasn't like that yeah. no, but, uh, and then you mentioned uh you know covid happened I, I, i've i've seen a lot of bands that they've signed like even signed by major labels and covid happened and it just kind of fell apart for them uh, which is a real shame so how, how did you pick yourself up you mentioned you brought a new epr was it just as simple as dusting off the last couple of years and just cracking on again was is that kind of what um it i did a lot of live streaming yeah. Shock horror, yep. <laughs> like the rest of the world yeah. um i think for me i've i've always i've never had a backup plan um, I think you're taught um, when you, you know, you're choosing careers and stuff like, oh, have this backup plan, this safe yeah. option. I would actually say if you're passionate enough um, to want to make it work, sometimes not having a backup plan is the best thing because you just like, no, I have to make this work. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the EP I released in 2020 and it, it flopped a little bit. Uh, one of the songs did pretty well, but the the EP was just like bad timing for me. Um and then, and I did, I, I did that with a crowdfunder. So I have an amazing fan base who are very, very generous and, and really want to help me. I think they want to be a part of the journey, oh. um, you know, believing in this person who was a busker that they saw on the street and kind of being a part of it. Um, and yeah, when it, I was just thrilled when, when the world started opening up because for me, like performing live is, is well, what I live for. Um, so as soon as I could do that again, it was uh, straight back out there. Um, and it was, yeah, it was difficult going back, starting again. Yeah. Um, but it, it, I don't know, that time was maybe really good for a lot of things, taking a break. Um, a lot of writing? I didn't really in lockdown. No. No. I was not inspired. I'm, gl I'm, I'm glad there wasn't like, a, you know, a million fucking lockdown albums that came out after. I was worried that there were going to be, you know, like. No, yeah, I think there were a few, money. weren't there? Yeah, I've stayed away from all of them. I, I, can't, I don't want to hear about it again. What was it Taylor Swift who like released like so much music and she was like, oh, I was writing every day. I'm like, oh my God, I did the, it, the fact that I was getting out of bed was <laughs> yeah. an achievement. Yeah, that is um, so no, I was not inspired to no. write in, in lockdown when the thing was happening. But um, but yeah, I started writing again and then released my debut album this year. So 2023. Um, wow. And, so now an album's a major achievement for anybody in it just to get that off your chest i suppose yeah it, it can be like yeah uh, when i when i speak to a lot of people that have just brought out an album it's you're not a new artist anymore you're kind of an established art, artist when you've had an album out and it's like right I've got, I've got to even work harder now to make this album work and and start a new chapter because for some people you you know tell me if this is, relates to you but once you've done an album that's kind of a chapter in your life done and you move on to another one how, how was that for you yeah um it's really interesting how the music industry moves so fast so mm -hmm. I literally released my album in March and I do some interviews and the first question people will be like oh what's next I'm like no 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 I've just released 10 songs of my debut <laughs> album and I really wanted to take this year to celebrate that and I don't mm -hmm. want to just move on and forget it because you know it was a lot of money it was a lot of time it was just so much of my life yeah. gearing up to releasing this debut album so I did um I did a tour in April full band tour um to promote the album and and it, that was really uh great to kind of perform those songs live for the first time and then again people are like oh when's the next music coming I'm like no wait 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 um, and I've just um, come off the back of a, an 11 date solo acoustic tour. So my manager and I um, parted ways after the last tour. No kind of bad blood, blood there. It was just like, OK, uh, we've kind of done all we can for each other. Um, and I think some artists would be like, oh, like panic. You know, 
is this not going to work? But for me, it kind of spurred me on. And I was like, right, let me get that passion again, that hustle that I had myself. Yeah. And I put on this tour completely uh, independently. So I don't have a manager, don't have a tour manager, don't have a booking agent, don't work with promoters. So I literally, I I did the whole thing, um, booked it myself. Uh, I was also, also, I'm exhausted by the way. I was also <laughs> my... Um, it was one thing um, organizing the tour. I loved that part, yeah. um, but actually doing it physically. So I also was my own driver. I went on my the tour on my own, no band. Um, I was doing my own doors. Right. Um, I was doing my own merch and then I was driving myself home. So um, a big, big achievement. Um, and I think now, that album is it can now kind of live and I can move on and write some new stuff but um I'm really glad that I've I've uh, really kind of milked the album for a year very good so so all these different experiences with different size crowds buskers there in the world what made you to start start thinking about that you know gigs could be a nicer place to be sometimes yeah so I have been lucky I've done loads of amazing gigs but I've also done really hard gigs yeah. where there's, you know, let's say, cause I'm, I'm really small level, but I'm don't normally play to 5,000 people with Texas. I'm playing club level grassroots music venues um, to, you know, 200 capacity maximum. And in those small rooms, if, if there's anything kind of disrupt, disruptive happening, it can really distract me as the artist. So uh, an example, I was I was supporting uh, Wildwood Kin um, in Scunthorpe. And I remember, so I released a song on my album called The Hardest Goodbye, which talks about baby loss, which is obviously really, God, really d- difficult song to, to perform. And I only kind of do it at certain gigs, but I thought, right, this is the, I'm gonna play this song. And before I play it, I'm introducing the song. And I talk, it was a song commission that I wrote for a couple of fans who had experienced miscarriage and baby um, and stillbirth. So I'm explaining this on stage. And it's, it's so difficult um, to even to do that, to get those words out without getting too emotional. And I'm doing it. And these like three drunk women like front row were just like cackling away chatting and I was thinking right they're not going to stop and I cannot I cannot sing this song with people talking um it's that song in particular it's so it 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 deserves people to to listen for three minutes yeah. um so I called them out and I, but I kept doing it I kept going like sorry ladies you're being really quite quite chatty there's a bar upstairs but the problem is they're so they're so loud talking that they don't even hear you calling them out. So that was one example. There's been many, but but you know, the majority of people in the room are are enjoying me, they're listening, and I can see them also getting annoyed with two, three people who are ruining the gig for everyone else just by chatting. So when I put on this solo acoustic tour, um, I decided to um, write out a list of kind of gig etiquette guidelines. Um, some might say rules, but it did say guidelines. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and it was um, it was almost to give people a heads up as they're walking into the environment to be like, this is what the artist expects from you as an audience member. I, it's a two way exchange. I'm going to be giving you my all. I've put. Like I said, I put this whole tour on myself. I put so much into this um, that all I want is though, you know, that hour, hour and a half to have a bit of mutual respect from the audience. Mm. Um, so I just said, <laughs> no talk. I, I put lots of things, but the general things. I've got it. I've got it. Go here. on. You what, tell me. What says, did I say? Don't talk during the show. Yeah, my, my eyes are going. Says so once the show starts, please refrain from talking. No matter how quiet you think you are, I promise everybody around you will hear you, including me. And it's quite distracting. Uh, wait till the interval. It's completely fair enough. It's it's 
it's hard work doing it because I, I I've put I've put many gigs on myself personally. Yeah, and I I see it, and I, and people do people do call people in the audience out, but after a few beers and things, people are just out to enjoy themselves, not necessarily understanding the impact they're having on the surroundings as well, do they? And it can feel I don't know. Uh, it, it, you can't change people. And it's hard. It's hard. You can you can have the best in, in uh, best intentions with it with it all. I I don't know if it if if people won't read stuff as well, will they? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know what I'm trying to say. It, it's really it's really difficult to to control a, a, a gig crowd when you don't know if they've had a hard week and they're just they've, they've had a few too many before the gig and they've just had a blowout. They're enjoying it with the friends and there's loads of different um, there's loads of different like parts of it isn't there that yeah and it is difficult it's really difficult to police it I guess is yeah. the word mm. um but I thought well at this at least if someone and you're right the people who are going to be disruptive probably won't read it but let's say because this was a really specific tour that I'm talking yes, about sure. it's, yeah. it's a seated tour and it was really intimate rooms so 30 people to 60 so tiny yeah. um so I just thought well if if maybe someone has turned up you know we're all there to have a good time but sometimes it's alcohol is often in, involved yeah. and if they're like you know there to maybe socialize with their friends and the music as an afterthought it's not really the gig for them like I want them to I want people to go to music um to, to live music to see live music and I think so many people will go to a gig as like a oh let's all catch up with my friends who I haven't seen for five years and let's use this gig as an excuse to do that please don't please go to the pub why are you coming to my gig to have a catch up like and and people think that I'm you know this awful person who's trying to you know I want people to have fun um but I think also asking people to to shut up and listen to to some music for an hour shouldn't be a massive thing but apparently it was very controversial oh i know i know <laughs> right, the right hullabaloo online weren't it? Brilliant. how dare i ask that i right enjoyed every minute of it mate well oh, done. oh i bet you did yeah. <laughs> so, i but, didn't <laughs> did you did you really not uh oh in, in fact we'll come to it a bit Let, let's let's go through them first and then we'll talk about okay oh yeah <laughs> i have so, more rules yeah no but, no the, the, the next bit is which i'm most passionate about this bit is being in okay the, 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 being actually being in the moment at a gig there's nothing better than being at whatever kind of show when you just, when you just, when you come round, sometimes you just come round and thought, you okay, know, I'm, I'm, I've just been in a different space there for a bit. Yeah. Just being in the moment at a gig is so precious and so enjoyable that when, when people spoil that moment for other people, that it's not on that, is it? Yeah. Um, I think I'm, I'm pretty lucky actually because my, the, the age of my fan base, obviously um no disrespect to radio 2 or wet 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 but when you, you when you perform on radio 2 yeah. and uh support bands like texas and wet 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 you get a, a slightly older crowd let's say yeah. which is actually pretty good because most of those people grew up going to gigs without we didn't have phones yeah. so um most people don't like film the whole thing but you do get a few people who will literally like uh, i'm looking out to the crowd and they're like watching you not even with their own eyes they're watching you through their phone and i just think if you just put that down you would enjoy it so much more there's not like there's nothing better than looking out and seeing someone like connecting with your music yeah um and you can't do that if you're filming it um I, so, I wonder what percentage of people watch that footage back the next day. I've, oh, I've, I've never, two percent max. Yeah, you don't. You uh, and I'm fine with people filming like a little clip. Um, I do it, of course, at gigs, and especially if if my my friends are playing, I'll almost kind of I'll film them. Not for me, it's for them to give them content to post, and I love doing that. But quite often, you know, I'm filming the thing myself. So you don't have to do that. To you don't need to do it for me. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you uh, you're with me on that one. <laughs> I, I'm with you on. I'm, I'm with. I'm with it all in general. It's Good. Just, it's just. It's just hard to police, and it? it's. Yeah. It's. It's aspirational, and and it's. It's definitely a problem that's out there. In it, there. Um. It's just you know how do you fix how do you fix humans sometimes. 
Well, you can try. That's the yeah, thing. Yeah, you can only you can only try. Yeah. Well, yeah, I can try. Maybe if maybe because I've had a couple of comments saying, um, actually, I didn't even think about this angle, but they're like, oh, um, thanks so much. Like, I'm autistic, and and I've I don't often go to gigs, and and I actually didn't realize that this is kind of the. That how I should behave so that's actually really helpful for me oh, nice. so I think things like that it's like oh actually people are finding it helpful and not patronizing they're like oh thanks so much now I know yeah. so you know there's been a lot of positive things that have come out of it I'm on this podcast oh yeah well definitely yeah I, you know I, I saw it all about and the, the next rule on there the audience have not paid to see you which is which is true little, might come across a little bit harsh but <laughs> it is true oh well <laughs> no, but it's true it's true though isn't it? you can't you can't you can't flower everything up in the world you've got to be honest and that's how you felt isn't it yeah well like sometimes it's like people uh you see I see it it's like look at me like they'll like face the back like put their back towards the artists and be like singing so the whole crowd will like look at them singing yeah. and it's like no 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 like if you want to put your own concert on and sell oh. tickets then please do um and I think I mentioned about singing along on that on that point yeah. so um I'm really fine with people singing along god there's no better feeling um than hearing an audience sing your own songs back at you especially if you don't have to teach them it um however <laughs> uh see I've been pushed to get to this point so I've done okay. so many yeah so many oh, yeah 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 um where there'll be like a couple of people who are like maybe they want to impress you and and they want you to see that they know your songs so they will scream the lyrics at you so much that like everyone in the audience are like looking at them you're trying not to look at them because it's so distracting and so i just <laughs> Yes, it's always that tune. <laughs> yes, yes. It's that's my problem. If you're gonna <laughs> sing beautifully along, even harmonize with me, lovely. Yeah. <laughs> if you're gonna sing out, it's all the people that are like tone deaf, and and you're like, okay, sing louder, and they're they're like screaming. You're like, no, 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 not you, not you. <laughs> but you can't say that. It is funny. And the last little bit, I will just we'll finish off the etiquette bit here. So yeah, just having an amazing time. So yeah, well said. You know, it, it, you. you it's it's my favorite thing to do my favorite pastime too is, is live music and just being in and around that environment it just brings me personally so much joy and it's what it's what spurred on me creating this music magazine rgm after being a failed musician and just cracking on and just wanting to stay in the industry in my own little way um i don't like that you call yourself a failed musician people have said that before i still i still noodle every now and again and play on that but I, 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 the band split up years ago and I never sung in it or anything. So I, I like, I, I still pull the guitar out every now and again. But, but you're not... still a musician. Doesn't mean you failed. Hey, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I promised to uh, to pay my mum's mortgage off as a musician and that didn't happen. Okay. Well, you might have failed at that. But, yeah. uh... <laughs> <laughs> that's, I think that's what I really mean. There's no money in music. Yeah, I know. You were never going to do that. <laughs> I'm still stupid now. So yeah, so <laughs> with these etiquette then, so so yeah, I saw it online and I, st I started to see it, you know, people sharing it and that kind of stuff. So when did you first like think, oh, oh, I've touched a nerve here online. When, when did you start like, talk, oh, talk, 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 talk me through that bit. This bit I'm fascinated with. So when I first posted it, I think obviously that it reached my audience who who know what I'm about and have seen yep. me live before. So they were like, yes. And yep. maybe they've been annoyed at someone at one of my gigs. So they're like, oh, thank God someone's saying it. And it was really positive. And I knew it would cause a little bit of controversy, yeah. but not quite. But then it it kind of reached this audience who thought I was talking about all gigs. So it reached like the Harry Styles kind of crowd who okay. were like, what? I'm not allowed to sing at a Harry Styles yeah. concert. I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah. I know, yeah. It's, it's getting out of context a bit. And, no, and, and, and their crowd in his crowd are a bit mental anyway, aren't they? I didn't say it. <laughs> and and that's not what people were like misquoting me. They were all like, oh, you can't, I can't believe she doesn't want people to sing. I'm like, I literally read it again because I said, please do sing along. Yeah. Um and yeah so it reached this I think most of the argument was out of context yeah um, 
anyone that you know would was debating this with me was not like if if I if they sat down and had five five minute conversation with me about it they would probably agree with me um so it reached those people then it started reaching like moshers I don't know if that's where you kill them and they were like What's this not? is not gig etiquette oh you, What's okay? a <laughs> you know what, what, like, what like a heavy metal type of crap yeah so they, right, were, okay. they were saying oh no you've got this wrong gig etiquette is if someone falls over in the mosh pit you help them out and i'm like no 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 one is moshing <laughs> right, to lucy right. Night walker right, right. so it's starting to get out of control now in it basically. and it with well, a tweet reached 1.6 million people oh. so um mm. i was getting a lot of hate but um it actually also it was pretty good because it, it meant that it was whittling out the people who would be disruptive and they were like oh i'm never going to come to your concerts i'm like great this is perfect oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> good yeah so 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 it got it got all this traction online and then how did it how did you end up getting on telly then in the morning so yeah um it actually it was pretty early on it was it was definitely not even reached like half a million at this point yeah. um good morning britain uh just emailed me saying hey Lucy can we give you a call I thought oh, here we go and um yeah they they said oh we'd love to for you to come on um the tv and debate this and I thought well okay uh and it was it was great for me because I was literally mid-tour and they said oh can you come on Monday and that was my one day off so I, I left one venue on the Sunday night came back to London did the TV um, appearance on the Monday morning and then I went up to Manchester. So it was great, like bit of um, promo for my tour. And so I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll come on. And they're like, right, we're going to get another guest on to debate um, with you. So they're going to like disagree with your points. And I thought they were going to get like an audience, a gig goer who who would disagree with me. But they said, no, we're going to find an artist. And I thought, well, good luck, because you're not going to find an artist who's going to tell you they love people talking. Yeah. But um, they did. They found one. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I, I watched it on the telly, and Rowetta uh, from the Happy Mondays, and she had her own solo here, and that's, that stuff was, didn't agree with you at all and didn't give you much opportunity to... It, it, it's one of the main reasons why I wanted to have a chat with you and have a long-form chat about this, because I don't feel... Um, it would you were fairly treating really. Uh, I think she did over talk you were quite a lot. I thought, yeah, you, thank I, thought you. I thought you were very graceful. I thought you did the best that you could do in that kind of situation. She obviously had a different opinion on it, and she and from her opinion, from what I got it, I'm, I'm not speaking for her, but what from I t- what I took from it was you should have the talent and the power to be able to close those people down in the crowd um yourself is it have I got the right gist of that do you think is that what was that I, I don't yeah I don't it was, that's just what I felt from it it was uh it was a really frustrating interview yeah. uh, debate debate yeah because I a bit we basically kind of how it works a little bit behind the scenes yeah. um we kind of almost not script it but we know each other's points right. and it went completely off that um so ended up feeling a bit of a, like a personal attack of, of me as a performer. And um, she knew nothing about what I do live. Like you speak to anyone who comes to see me live. Like that is what I'm best at. Um, I put on like a show, not just me singing songs. Like people were like, wow, this is like, it's half comedy, half music. It's like, we cry, we laugh, we have an amazing time. But that that debate was almost like, you're rubbish that's why no one's listening I'm like no 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 you've no that's not how it is and yeah it was it was difficult um because she just wouldn't let me speak so I had all these points that I wanted to make and I just couldn't get them out um so yeah it was it was good uh, it was good good PR for me but it was uh not a nice experience and and I I would never wish that on on anyone because it wasn't just on the TV it was also backstage as well well I was going to ask what what happened after the chat when the when the when the cameras went off what what, uh, what for that? it wasn't afterwards it was the before oh, bit okay. um it was basically exactly what you saw on TV was happening in the makeup room um yeah. which was horrible yeah. but it prepared me um, for what it was going to be like uh, on live TV. Um, so I was prepared 
and I think that's why I was just smiling because I was like I can't believe that this is real um it was it's just trying to talk over someone I just it's not maybe I'm not meant for tv I'm definitely not meant for that kind of um environment um I yeah. don't know. I, I, I don't know about that. You know, you, you you did hold your own. You were graceful. You you came across really well. I I thought I need to speak to Lucy. I, I know there's a, a, a deeper story in here. Oh, thank and you. I, and and, and I, I suppose I, I appreciate the graph that goes on at Grassroots Music. I see it every day as well. So I just thought there's a, there's a, there's a lass here that's just grafting. She's been asked to come on telly about this, what she sees in the real world that goes on in the music industry. And she didn't quite get the chance to, for it to come across the way that she wanted. So that's why, that's why I wanted to chat with you really. That's how I felt about it. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I, I had so many points that I wanted to make, but I just, I couldn't get a word in it, Joyce. Yeah. Um, but, it, but if anything, it kind of proved my point. It was like, this is exactly um, the kind of person who I wouldn't want at my, at my shows. Cause it's, you know, disruptive and, um, it almost proved my point um, for me without me having to to say much. Yeah. So um, I'm really proud of, of, I wish I could have made more points, but I'm really proud of how I kept my composure. And that's yeah. all the comments were like, whoa, Lucy, you, <laughs> how, how did you sit there and not cry? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> so, so yeah, just being, being on the telly and stuff. And then, so it must've helped the tour flog a few tickets. Yeah, I did actually. So more eyes on your music, that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's it's been pretty great for me. I unfortunately all the clips have been taken down now um, on, oh. of the interview um, for duty of care, um, not for me. Uh, let's just say oh, that. Okay. Which is, well, a, a is that the ITV guidelines? They've viewed, viewed it and think it's not it's not suitable for. I think I think, there anymore. I think it was the backlash that the the other guest was getting. Um, right. Okay on on twitter and everything um which is a shame for me because it was you know a great bit of pr but um i still have the clip so maybe i'll okay fair enough, fair enough. um yeah i sold a few tickets I, it was more of the twitter thing than the tv thing actually because um a guy came to manchester and he'd never heard of me uh, on the morning of the manchester gig he saw that tweet you can do you call them tweets anymore x yeah i'm yeah. gonna call it a tweet yeah I, I... um he saw the tweet in the morning and he was like oh i'm i love this kind of thing and bought a ticket to my manchester gig and then it sold out so five of my tour dates sold out completely um and he was front row at the manchester gig he started the standing ovation he bought a vinyl so oh. um it's reached the right people um <laughs> and whittled out the people who shouldn't be coming to my gigs anyway. So um, I, I'm thrilled. Well done, mate. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> proper, proper, like, it's just proper, like, getting yourself, again, it's getting yourself out of your comfort zone, isn't it? Putting stuff out there that you said yourself, using your own words, you know it's, you know it's going to, you know, it's going to cause some ripples on the internet. Never really expecting it to do what it did. Yeah, but, that it but, went crazy. Yeah, brilliant. So, so looking back on the, um, on the guidelines then, uh, would you change any of them now looking back on it um not really maybe maybe oh. the sing alongy one I think that was so specific um mm. to certain people that come to see me and and maybe I'd I don't know I still think it's good to kind of read that and go oh maybe I'm someone who does that at Lucy's gigs and to be yeah. fair the tour was absolutely amazing if anything people were terrified of me um, <laughs> which is great that's how I want them you're gonna behave cool <laughs> so no I you know I, I probably wouldn't change it um and it, yes it blew up but it got me a lot of <laughs> promotion and and maybe people will know my name now and maybe people actually got loads of comments saying I've actually stopped going to live gigs because of of um, the behavior of people so if this is the precedent that you're setting at your gigs then yeah. maybe I'll, I'll come to one of yours so yeah. um I think that's amazing so um yeah I don't regret it at all yeah, well done well done so just moving on then so you're off to South Korea tomorrow you say oh god yeah, yeah what's yeah. all that about <laughs> <laughs> the tour has been the tour finished on Sunday I did a gig last night and I just haven't had time to think about it I um I entered a Buskers World Cup oh. um a few months ago and uh didn't expect anything from it and I got into 
it's not the final there's different rounds once I'm there but um yeah so I'm being flown out to Guangzhou well to Seoul and then we go to Guangzhou which is three and a half hours from from Seoul um I'm there for about 10 days taking part in this competition um the Buskers World Cup I have no idea what to expect I'm just I'm honestly going for, you know when people enter a competition they're like no I'm not doing it for the competition <laughs> yeah. like I really truly am going for the life experience I would never um get the opportunity to go to South Korea so um I'm going for that I'm going to to meet lots of uh, other musicians and um if anything comes of it then amazing um I'm I'm excited I can imagine yeah is there any other people that you know that's going out there from the busker community as well yeah I'm really lucky so I've got a couple of friends um my friend Freddie June is coming and Daisy Chute and I've got also um a, a duo who I met busking at Edinburgh Fringe Festival from the States um called the little the little things so um yeah I know some people which is going to be um it's going to make the experience even better because we're all getting the same flight and stuff so uh oh, yeah, I'm well excited I'd love to. I'm planning to go to Japan next year, and I've never, oh, I've, I've never visited that side of the world, and I'm fascinated by it, like Korea and Japan and uh, China. Mm. Oh, it's just, it just feels like it's just got to be an alien world to me that I just want to get involved with and find out what it's all about. Yeah, me too. I'm a bit nervous about the food because I'm a bit of a yeah. picky eater, but um, oh, let's see. Well, there'll be good um Korean chicken at least. I might yeah. just live off that. But, um... <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, good luck with the competition, mate. Are you are you are you in it to win it then? What? No, no, a little, because a little bit. It would be nice because you win it, but um, but no, no, no. I'm I'm I promise I'm I'm going for the for the life experience. Um, but if I do, I'll let you know if I if yeah, I do well. <laughs> oh, nice. Well, we'll share it all in your socials and, um. Lucy Bay Walker, I've really enjoyed getting to know you and uh, learning about your journey in the music industry. It's always fascinating. Uh, your, your, your journey sounds like it's just started, really. The graph starts now, really, I suppose, and you push uh, yourself on and move on in the world and keep ruffling feathers. I love it. Thanks so much. I will keep ruffling feathers. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, thanks for that, mate. Nice one. Yay!